Good afternoon and welcome. Um, we are pleased that you've joined us for, the, for this webinar on food safety for the holiday season. My name is Virginia White and I'm a leader of the Extension Disaster Education Network Community of Practice um, that's hosting this today or sponsoring this webinar today. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and we will post a link to the archive on the LEARN event. Um, you'll see that URL that we had up there just a minute ago again at the end of today's session. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. The chat pod is where you can ask questions. Um, there will be time at the end of the presentation for questions, but please feel free to submit them anytime during the session. Our presenter today is Dr. Su Yan An. Uh, Dr. An is Assistant Professor in Food Science and Human Nutrition Department at the University of Florida in Gainesville. She received her PhD in Food Science from Cornell University in 2003, and she received her BS and her Master's in Food Science and Biotechnology from Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea in 1996 and 1998, respectively. So prior to joining University of Florida, she worked as an assistant professor of food science at Arkansas State University. She was there from 2006 to 2011. Dr. An also worked as a postdoc research associate in the Department of Chemistry at Tufts University. She was there from 2003 to 2005. And then she was in the School of Molecular Biosciences at Washington State University from 2005 to 2006. Her areas of expertise include food safety and sanitation, pathogen direction using molecular diagnostics, biosensors, and control of microbial contamination in beef and poultry. Uh, Dr. An's current research interest is in the control of microbial contamination in pre- and post-harvest settings and detection of foodborne pathogens. Dr. An is a member of several scientific societies, including the Institute of Food Technologists and the International Association of Food Protection. She is currently serving as a reviewer and an editorial board member for seven journals. Dr. An, we're really glad to have you here today. Thank you, Virginia. Hi, I'm Sue Wan, and um, today I'm here to talk about how to prepare and cook safe holiday meals for a coming holiday season. Food is always an important part of a holiday festivities. In parties, family dinners, and other gatherings, food is served as a part of the holiday cheer. But holiday meals can take a turn for the worse if food safety is not properly practiced in preparing and cooking the food. The food you serve your family and friends can be very harmful if your turkey, ham, or meatballs aren't handled safely or refrigerated promptly. The good news here is that by practicing basic food safety measures, you can help prevent foodborne illnesses. In this webinar, I will first share some interesting foodborne illness facts as a background information. And then I will discuss specific risks associated with the holiday meals. And the most important part of today's talk will be the safe practices for a holiday meal preparation. And of course, holiday cheers is not the only thing about winter. There is a possibility of a winter storm and ice storm over winter seasons. And as a last topic of this webinar, I will discuss how we can safely handle food during and after winter storms. According to, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. According to the most recent um, CDC estimation, Every year, there are 48 million illnesses and 130,000 hospitalizations caused by foodborne pathogens in the United States. And some of the severe cases can lead to deaths, and it is estimated 3,000 deaths occur in the U.S. every year due to foodborne illnesses.
top five pathogens are responsible for about 91% of foodborne illnesses caused by known agents. And some of these top five pathogens might be familiar names to you. Norovirus, Salmonella, and Staphylococcus aureus, Campylobacter, Clostridium perfringens. Especially, norovirus cause more than half of domestic foodborne illnesses. However, the most serious cases that require hospitalizations or that can result in deaths are still caused by bacterial agents, not by viruses. And there are agents that most people, um, um, these, uh, these, uh, the serious ones are the agents that most people are familiar with because you hear about them uh, from the news all the time. This table shows the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths with the rates of hospitalization and deaths for five major bacterial foodborne pathogens. Campylobacter, the major foodborne pathogen in poultry, and Listeria monocytogenes that have been historically associated with deli meat, but now more more implicated with produce contamination, and Salmonella, which is the cost evasion of the most number of bacterial foodborne illnesses in the United States with more than 1 million cases per year, and Shiga toxin producing E. coli, including O157H7. These are top five major bacterial foodborne pathogens. And many of these pathogens have high hospitalization and death rates, and therefore, they have been a great concern in food safety. And you would notice that even though the number of cases is not that big in case of Listeria monocytogenes, they are still considered as a major foodborne pathogens because they have a high hospitalization rate and high death rate than any other pathogens. General symptoms of a foodborne illness start within 12 to 48 hours after ingestion, and they last 2 to 10 days. However, um, their onset time and um, duration can vary, um, just um, diverse. For example, um, Steph Staphylococcus aureus um, shows its symptoms as early as one hour after ingestion, However, something like hepatitis A shows its symptoms 28 days after ingestion on average. While different pathogens show different symptoms, most foodborne illnesses cause abdominal pain, watery or bloody diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. And some pathogens also cause fever too. Clostridium botulinum, which produces neurological toxin called botulinum toxin, can cause neurological symptoms, including muscle weakness, blurred or double vision, and in serious cases, respiratory failure and even death. Hepatitis A virus affects liver function and therefore causes symptoms such as jaundice and dark urine. While various foods can be associated with foodborne illnesses, some types of foods are more associated with specific types of pathogens. Currently, undercooked meat and poultry and eggs are causing the most number of foodborne um, illnesses, and these food products are commonly associated with Salmonella, Campylobacter, and Shiga toxin producing E. coli. Fresh fruits and vegetables also account for approximately 35% of the entire U.S. foodborne illnesses. Other than these major food types, unpasteurized juice or raw milk, ready-to-eat meats such as deli meats and seafood, including shellfish, are considered as potential hazardous foods for foodborne illnesses. So, who are considered as at-risk groups for foodborne illnesses? Infants and young children are more at risk because their immune systems are still developing. 
Likewise, the immune system of the older adults are not as strong as healthy adults, and therefore they are more susceptible to foodborne illnesses. Many older adults have chronic conditions, and this can further weaken their immune system. In addition, with aging, stomach acid decreases, and this can put older adults at higher risk for foodborne illnesses, since stomach acid plays an important role in reducing the number of bacteria in the intestinal tract. Body changes during pregnancy, and um, this can alter the mother's immune system as well, and therefore pregnant women are more susceptible to foodborne illnesses. Harmful bacteria can also cross the placenta and infect the unborn baby whose immune system is underdeveloped and therefore cannot fight infection. Foodborne illness during pregnancy is really serious since it can lead to miscarriage, premature delivery, stillbirth, and sickness or even death of a newborn baby. So all these people are considered as a high risk group for foodborne illnesses. Excuse me. Additionally, the immune system of transplant patients and people with certain illnesses, um, such as AIDS, cancer, and diabetes, are often uh, weakened from this, their diseases or the side effects of the treatment and making them susceptible to many types of infections. So, what I, what I have mentioned so far applies to any food, not just holiday meals. So, what is different about holiday meals and why do we need to care about holiday food safety? As I mentioned earlier, food is an important part of a holiday celebration, but too much food can be a food safety hazard. What do I mean by this? First, you are cooking for more people than usual, and cooking a larger batch of food often can result in undercooking. And also, think about holiday feast. You need to cook so many different dishes at the same time. When things get complicated, errors can occur. Even after the meal, you need to find appropriate storage places for all foods, and in many cases, when you cook too much, then there will be a lot of leftovers, which lead to food safety problems unless stored properly. Think about the environment too. Many family members share your holiday meal, and they can include the people considered a high-risk group in food safety, like infants, young children, older adults, or pregnant relatives. Since you share your meal with more people than usual, when there is any problems with your food, any kind of a contamination, then that can affect more people than usual as well, which means potential outbreak. Okay, last but not least, during the holiday season, you could send or receive many mail order food gifts, and some of these items are perishable, which deserve your good planning and care. And some of the um, uh, holiday food actually are associated with high risk. Turkey, uh, especially with stuffing, have been associated with some uh, problems, especially with the Campylobacter and Salmonella uh, in the past. So it needs to be cooked thoroughly. And also eggnog, which um, use um, uh, eggs as main ingredients, also have been associated with the problems before. So I will talk about um, these two specific foods a little um, more detail later on. So whether you cook your daily meal for a family of four or you cook your big holiday feast for the extended family of 20, you can ensure the safety of a food you are cooking by following four simple golden rules. And this will be your take home message. First, clean. Second, separate. Third, cook. And fourth, chill. Now, you will discuss um, 
the details about these four simple golden rules for food safety. First rule is to clean. This means you need to clean yourself, clean food contact surfaces before, during, and after cooking, and wash appropriate food um, before their consumption. First, wash your hands with warm water and soap for 20 seconds before and after handling any food. Keep in mind that hand sanitizer cannot be a replacement for washing hands with soap and water since it cannot uh, be effective against certain types of pathogens, including most viruses. Second, wash food contact surfaces, which means cutting board, dishes, utensils, and countertops with hot soapy water after preparing each food item. Rinse fruits and vegetables thoroughly under cool running water and use a produce brush to remove surface dirt, especially for fruits and vegetables with rough surfaces, such as cantaloupe. Do not rinse raw meat and poultry before cooking in order to avoid spreading bacteria to areas around the sink and countertops. Second rule is to separate. When shopping in the store, storing food in the refrigerator at home, or preparing meals, keep foods that won't be cooked separate from raw eggs, raw meat, raw poultry, or seafood, and from kitchen utensils used for those products. Consider using one cutting board only for foods that will be cooked, such as raw meat, poultry, and seafood, and another one for those that will not be cooked, such as raw fruits and vegetables. And do not put cooked meats or other food that is ready to eat on an unwashed plate that has held any raw eggs, meat, poultry, seafood, or their juices. Also, keep fish and seafood, raw turkey, roast um, uh, hams, or other meats and their juices separate from other side dishes when preparing meals to prevent any kind of a cross-contamination. Third rule is to cook thoroughly. Cook meat and poultry to a safe minimum internal temperature. For example, turkey, stuffing, casseroles, and leftovers should be heated to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Beef, veal, and lamb roast to 145 de uh, degree Fahrenheit, and fully cooked ham to 140 degree, and fresh ham, pork, and egg dishes to 160. When you measure the internal temperature, always use a food thermometer, and if um, chitlings are on your menu, then boil the chitlings for five minutes before cleaning and preparing them. To check a turkey for safety, insert a food thermometer into the innermost part of the thigh and wing and the thickest part of the breast. Because depending on where you put your thermometer into turkey, sometimes the reading can be quite different. The turkey is safe when the temperature reaches 165 degree. If the turkey is stuffed, then temperature of the stuffing also should be 165 degree. Bring sauces, soups, and gravies to a rolling boil when reheating. A rolling boil is when a liquid is boiled rapidly with lots of bubbling. And cook eggs until the yolk and white are firm, so they wouldn't be runny. When making your own eggnog or other recipe calling for raw eggs, such as custard or key lime pie, whenever possible, use pasteurized shell eggs or liquid or frozen pasteurized egg products or powdered egg whites. Be sure that eggs and products containing eggs are thoroughly cooked when serving those, especially at higher risk uh, group for uh, foodborne illnesses. And don't eat uncooked cookie dough, which may contain raw eggs.
fourth rule is to chill. And this is especially important for leftovers. Refrigerate leftovers and take out foods and any type of food that should be refrigerated, including pie, within two hours because harmful bacteria grow rapidly at room temperature. Set your refrigerator at or below 40 degree and the freezer at zero degree. Check both periodically with an appliance or thermometer. Sell frozen food safely in the refrigerator or under cold running water or in the microwave, but never at room temperature. Cook food thawed in cold water or in the microwave immediately. When you thaw food, allow enough time to properly thaw food. For example, a 20-pound turkey needs four to five days to thaw completely in the refrigerator. And even the refrigerated leftovers should be used within three to four days unless they are frozen. And don't taste the food that looks or smells questionable. Again, the golden rule here is when in doubt, just throw it out. Again, I'm just repeating this message one more time because it's really important. The four gold rules in food safety is clean, separate, cook, and chill. And this is the message I'm hoping you could keep even after this webinar is over. With convenience becoming more important uh, factor in shopping than ever, the ultimate time saver and convenience is home delivery of mail order foods. However, ordering food um, through the mail may cause concerns about food safety. It's important to have a kind of a mental checklist for how food and packaging should look when mail order food arrive. Keep in mind that mail order foods must be carefully handled in a timely manner to prevent foodborne illness. When you receive an item, make sure the company sends perishable items like meat or poultry a cold or frozen and packed with a cold source like a blue ice or dry ice. It should be packed in foam or heavy uh, corrugated cardboard. The food should be delivered as quickly as possible, ideally overnight. The outer package of the perishable items should be labeled keep refrigerated to alert the recipient. When you receive a food item marked keep refrigerated, open it immediately and check its temperature. The food should arrive frozen or partially frozen with ice crystals still visible or at least refrigerate, um, refrigerator cold, which means below 40 degrees as measured with a food thermometer. Even if a product is smoked, cured, vacuum packaged, or fully cooked, it still is a perishable product and must be kept cold. If perishable food arrives warm, which means above 40 degrees as measured with a thermometer, then notify the company and do not consume the food and do not even taste the suspect food. Sometimes you need to ruin surprise for food safety. So um, even though you are sending um, some mail order food or uh, food you cooked as a gift, you still tell the recipient um, if the company had a promised a delivery date or alert the recipient that the gift is in the mail and on um, its way. So someone can be there to receive it. Don't have a perishable items delivered to an office unless you know it will arrive on a work day and there is a refrigerator space available for keeping it cold. When you mail homemade food, make sure perishable foods are not held at temperatures between 40 and 140 degrees, which is the so-called um, so danger zone, for longer than two hours. Pathogenic bacteria can grow rapidly in this danger zone, but they may not affect the taste, the smell, or appearance of a food. 
In other words, you cannot tell that a food has been mishandled or is unsafe to eat just by looking at it or smelling it. Make sure your perishable items are packed properly by creating miniature defreezing packaging using dry ice and cooler. And this is an example uh, from the government um, uh, website that how this miniature defreeze packaging needs to be done. So you could get some ideas how your food needs to be packed when you're trying to ship it. Now, let's discuss some of the holiday meals that have higher risks than others and need special care for cooking. Holiday would not be perfect, or Thanksgiving especially, uh, would not be perfect without a big oven roasted turkey. However, to cook turkey safely, you need to make a good plan from its sawing to roasting. Turkey must be kept at a safe temperature during the big saw. While frozen, a turkey is safe indefinitely. However, as soon as it begins to thaw, any bacteria that may have been present before freezing can begin to grow again. A package of frozen meat or poultry left thawing on the counter at room temperature more than two hours is not at a safe temperature. Even though the center of the package may still be frozen, the outer layer of the food is in the danger zone between 40 and 140 at a temperature where foodborne bacteria multiply rapidly. And there are three safe ways to thaw food in the refrigerator, in cold running water, and in a microwave oven. When sawing a turkey in the refrigerator, you need to plan ahead. Allow approximately 24 hours for each 4 to 5 pounds in a refrigerator set at 40 or below. Place the turkey in a container to prevent the juices from dripping on other foods that can uh, cause cross-contamination. And this table from foodsafety.gov site can be a good reference to make a plan for thawing a turkey. A thawed turkey can remain in the refrigerator for one to two days before cooking. Food thawed in the refrigerator can be refrozen without cooking, but there may be some loss of quality, even though they are still safe to consume. When thawing a turkey in cold water, allow 30 minutes per pound. First, be sure the turkey is in a leak-proof plastic bag to prevent cross-contamination and to prevent the turkey from absorbing water resulting in a watery product. Submerge the wrapped turkey in cold tap water and change the water every 30 minutes until the turkey is thawed. And cook the turkey immediately after it is thawed when you're thawing in cold water. To thaw a turkey in a microwave oven, follow the oven manufacturer's instruction and plan to cook it immediately after thawing because some areas of the food may become warm and begin to cook during microwaving. Holding partially cooked food is not recommended because any bacteria present wouldn't have been destroyed entirely. For optimal safety and uniform doneness, cook stuffing separately. However, if you decide to stuff a turkey, it is essential to use a food thermometer to make sure the center of the stuffing reaches a safe minimum internal temperature of 165 degrees. Cooking a home stuffed turkey is riskier than cooking one not stuffed. Even if the turkey itself has reached the safe minimum internal temperature, as measured in the innermost part of the thigh, wing, the thickest part of the breast, as I mentioned earlier, the stuffing may not have reached a temperature high enough to destroy bacteria that may be present. Bacteria can survive in stuffing that has not reached 165 degrees, possibly resulting in foodborne illness. If you plan to prepare stuffing using raw meat, poultry, or shellfish, 
You should cook these ingredients before stuffing the turkey to reduce the risk of a foodborne illness from bacteria that may be found in raw ingredients. The wet ingredients for stuffing can be prepared ahead of time and refrigerated. However, do not mix wet and dry ingredients until just before spooning the stuffing mixture into the turkey cavity. Do not cool the stuffing. Spoon it directly into the turkey cavity right after preparation and stuff the turkey loosely about um, three-fourths cup of a stuffing per pound. And stuffing should be moist, not dry, because heat destroys bacteria more rapidly in a moist environment. And immediately place the stuffed raw turkey in an oven set no lower than 325 degrees. Now, let's discuss how to safely roast the turkey. First, set the oven temperature no lower than 325 degrees. Preheating is not necessary. Before roasting, you should be sure the turkey is completely thawed and times are based on fresh or thawed birds at a refrigerator temperature of 40 or below. Place turkey breast side up on a flat wire rack in a shallow roasting pan, about two to two and a half inches deep. And you can optionally add one half cup water to the bottom of the pan. In the beginning, a tent of aluminum foil may be placed loosely over the breast of the turkey for the first um, one to one and a half hours, then removed for browning or a tentable foil may be placed over the turkey after the turkey has reached the, the desired golden brown color. As I mentioned earlier in stuffing a turkey, it is optimal to cook stuffing in a casserole for food safety. However, if stuffing your turkey, mix ingredients just before stuffing it and stuff loosely. Again, for safety and doneness, the internal temperature should be checked with a food thermometer, and the temperature of the turkey and a center of stuffing must reach a safe minimum internal temperature of 165 degrees. And do not remove the stuffing from the turkey before it reaches 165 degrees because the undercooked stuffing could contaminate the cooked meat. And if the stuffing is inside the whole poultry, then take the poultry out of the oven and let it stand 20 minutes before remove the stuffing. And refrigerate cooked poultry and stuffing within two hours. Place leftovers in shallow containers and you must use them within three to four days. And reheat leftover also to a safe minimum internal temperature of 165 degrees. This table provides a reference for roasting time for stuffed and unstuffed turkey based on their size. Remember that the given times are based on fresh or thawed. Therefore, it is important to thaw the turkey completely before roasting because if it's not completely thawed, then it might need more time. And again, it's really hard to control, you know, just from the perspective of food safety. Homemade eggnog is a tradition in many families during the holiday season. But each year, this creamy drink causes many cases of um, salmonellosis. The ingredient responsible, usually raw or undercooked eggs. And eggs are a standard ingredient in most homemade eggnog recipes, giving the beverage its characteristic frothy texture. So um, to prevent this ingredient from causing harmful infections, you have to follow a safe food handling practices. FDA advises consumers to start with a cooked egg base for eggnog, and this is especially important if you are serving people at high risk for foodborne infections. 
to make a cooked egg base, combine eggs and half the milk as indicated in the recipe and cook the mixture gently to an internal temperature of 160, stirring constantly. And that cooking will destroy salmonella if um, any present. Some people think that adding rum, whiskey, or other um, alcohol to the recipe will make the eggnog safe. But if contaminated, unpasteurized eggs are used in eggnog, you can't count on the alcohol in the drink to kill all of the bacteria. That's not probably going to happen. And you can also use egg substitute or pasteurized eggs in your eggnog, and you can find a recipe um, even without any eggs even though I'm not sure how um, tasty that would be. Uh, with the egg substitute products, you might have to experiment a little bit uh, with the recipe to figure out the right amount to add for the best flavor. Or pasteurized eggs can also be used in place of raw eggs for the recipe. Commercial pasteurization of eggs is a heat process at low temperatures that destroys salmonella that might be present without having a noticeable effect on flavor or nutritional content. And these are available at some supermarkets for a slightly higher cost per dozen. Um, if, and even if you are using pasteurized eggs for your eggnog, both the FDA and USDA recommend starting with a cooked egg base for optimal safety. So, by following these safe handling and proper cooking practices, you can enjoy delicious, creamy, homemade eggnog without worrying about making anybody sick. Now, let's take a little different turn here. Holidays are a nice part of winter, but also there is a different side of winter too. During the cold winter season, you will expect to have one or two snowstorms unless you live in much milder climate. And why am I suddenly talking about winter storm here? Because the loss of power from snow or ice could jeopardize the safety of your food. And knowing how to determine if food is safe and how to keep food safe will help minimize the potential loss of food and reduce the risk of foodborne illnesses during any winter storms. As a preparation for winter storms, stock food items on hand that don't require refrigeration and can be eaten cold or heated on the outdoor grill. Self-stable food, boxed or canned milk, water, and canned goods should be part of this planned emergency food supply. And make sure you have ready-to-use baby formula for infants and also pet food if you have any pets. Remember to use these items and replace them from time to time unless you just open the box in, when the emergency occurs and you realize that all the items in the box are actually um, just all expired and cannot be consumed. Also, be sure to keep a handheld can opener for an emergency. Consider what you can do ahead of time to store your food safely in an emergency, and coolers are a great help for keeping food cold if the power will be out for more than four hours. Have a couple um, of uh, uh, coolers on hand along with the frozen gel packs. When, you, when your freezer is not full, then keep items close together when electricity is out, and this will help the food stay cold longer. And a food thermometers and appliances thermometers will help you know if the food is safe um, or not. Keep appliance thermometers in the refrigerator and freezer at all times, and when the power is out, an appliance thermometer will always indicate the temperature in the refrigerator and freezer no matter how long the power has been out. The refrigerator temperature should be 40 or below, the freezer um, zero or lower. And if you're not sure a particular food is cold enough, take its temperature with a food thermometer. And keep the refrigerator and freezer doors closed as much as possible to maintain the cold temperatures. The refrigerator will keep food safe cold for about four hours if it is, if it is unopened, even the power is out. 
and full freezer will hold the temperature for approximately 48 hours. And if it's only half a full, then about 24 hours if the door remains closed. And obtain dry or a block of ice to keep your refrigerator as cold as possible if the power is going to be out for a, prolong a prolonged period of time. And again, you have to plan ahead and find out where dry ice and block of ice can be purchased. Now, during the power outages, keep the refrigerator and freezer doors closed as much as possible to maintain the cold temperature. Because each time the door is open, a significant amount of refrigeration is lost. And the refrigerator will keep food safely cold for about four hours, again, uh, if it is unopened. And again, freezer can um, uh, keep the food frozen for about 48 hours if entirely full or if it's half full for about 24 hours. If the pow uh, power is going to be out, again, you have to have dry ice or block of ice. And 50 pounds of dry ice should hold about 18 cubic foot full freezer for two days and place meat and poultry to one side of the freezer or on a tray to prevent cross-contamination of sawing juices when power is out. If the power has been out for several days, then check the temperature of the freezer with an appliance thermometer or food thermometer. If the food still contains ice crystals or it uh, it, it is at 40 degrees or below, then the food is just safe. Discard refrigerated perishable food such as meat, poultry, fish, uh, milk, eggs, or leftovers after four hours without power. However, never taste the food to determine its safety. When you have a snowy, cold winter weather outside while you have a power outages inside, you might wonder if it is okay to put the food from the refrigerator and freezer and put it out in the snow. The answer is no. Frozen food can thaw if it is exposed to the sun's rays even when the temperature is very cold. Refrigerated food may become too warm and foodborne bacteria could grow. The outside temperature could vary hour by hour, and the temperature outside will not protect refrigerated and frozen food. Additionally, perishable items could be exposed to unsanitary conditions or even to the animals. Animals may harbor bacteria or disease and uh, never consume any food that has come in contact with an animal. Rather than putting the food outside, what you could do is um, uh, take advantage of a cold temperature by making ice. Fill buckets or empty milk cartons or cans with water and leave them outside to freeze and then use that as a block of ice to keep your refrigerator, freezer, or coolers cold. When you have your power bag, you should evaluate each item separately. First, check the temperature inside your refrigerator and freezer. And if an appliance thermometer was kept in the freezer, then read the temperature when the power comes back on. If the appliance thermometer stored in the freezer reads 40 or below, then the food is safe and may be refrozen. If a thermometer has not been kept in the freezer, then you have to check each package of food to determine the safety. Again, remember that you cannot rely on its appearance or odor. If the food just still contains ice crystals or it has a temperature of 40 or below by food thermometer, then it is safe to refreeze. Partial thawing and refreezing may eggs that has been above 40, for two, 40 degrees for two hours or more. And be sure to discard um, any items in either the freezer or the refrigerator that have come in contact with raw meat juices. 
and check each item separately and throw them out, um, which has um, a neutral odor, color, or texture, or feels warm when you touch it. And again, I just keep repeating this message because it is important, but it is critical to never taste the food to decide if it's safe. Golden rule here again is when in doubt, throw it out. In this webinar, we discussed the holiday meal food safety and safe food handling practices during winter storms. And even though we discussed many topics, the most important things are four rules for food safety in your food preparation, which are clean, separate, cook, and chill. And when you have any doubt, then throw your food out. Again, these um, golden rules apply to any type of food preparation, not just for holiday meals. And there are many great resources from government agency websites or public extension services, and they are available online. You can find details about holiday food safety in the list of the websites, and also um, there is a YouTube video about how to cook a turkey safely. By following these safe food handling practices, I hope you have a great, safe holiday season this year. So, happy early holidays, everyone. Thank you, Sue. That was uh, very informative. Um, while some folks are starting to type in their questions, I have one for you. Um, and it, uh, it, it deals with uh, your four golden rules. Uh, it, and it is, is there one of those rules that most people tend to forget? that causes the foodborne illness or can lead to it? Um, surprisingly, um, uh, the uh, previous multiple studies about uh, people personal hygiene, a lot of people actually um, do not um, wash their hands, um, especially when, whenever they change it from one food item to another item, or they do not wash the cutting board after um, using um, the cutting board for raw meat. So uh, surprisingly, actually, first rule to clean is to something that people easily forget. Um, actually, cook part um, or the chill part, I think they're um, relatively observed well, but um, clean and separate part, I think that's the part that people are easily forget or not very well following. Very good. Thank you. Um, Barbara has a question in the chat pod. She says, do you have any recommendations on best food thermometers? Hmm. Um, not really. Uh, there are many different types of uh, 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 food thermometers, so some are with the dyers, so some are um, um, digiters. But again, um, it, um, I, I just, you know, as long as it can just correctly uh, measure the temperatures, any type would work. Um, and just people have just different preferences. So, no, I just don't have any specific um, recommendations. But what I could recommend strongly is to simply use um, food thermometers and appliance thermometers. Kind of a follow-up to that, um, if it doesn't matter whether you're using a dial or a digital thermometer, is there a way to check either one's accuracy? Um, no, not really. Um, if, you know, just um, unless you just really notice this problem with, you know, time, you know, they you just we found that you know just most of the uh, different types of thermometers work pretty well however some have like you know some types of have like a different types of a probe at the end and some people find it is much easier to uh, put them in the turkey or into the meat and I think those types of um, um, Thermometers just work well. Again, it's not about the accuracy of the uh, uh, the temperature reading, but more of the uh, um, the easiness of you know how to use it with the uh, the food itself. I see. All right. Um, well, while um, it looks like we might have a few other people typing in questions, I'm going to ask our audience a question, and it is. What do you plan to do with the information from today's webinar? And if you'll just type your answers into the chat pod, I'll really appreciate that. Okay. Um, so we'll give folks a minute or two to um, answer that question. 
Okay, so for um, today's um, seminar's information, I'm planning to a write a short uh, fact sheet um, so all the participants have get access to it as a, like a little um, take on uh, fact sheets um, for easy access, um, kind of summarize all the uh, lessons I've uh, been talking today. Uh -huh. um, that's what I'm planning to do. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Well, I see a lot of people are planning to share the information. Um, I like uh, Leah's answer. She says she's not, she won't put food outside in the snowbank. Um, and then Renee says, remind customers, consumers to be prepared in the event of a weather event such as power outages due to heavy snow. And I know there are some, some places right now that need that reminder, especially in the Northeast. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Well, this is wonderful. Y'all keep on answering that, and I have one more question for you. Sure. That is, what is your biggest takeaway from today's webinar? Um, as I mentioned in um, um, summary, again, there are four golden rules, um, clean, separate, uh, cook, and chill, because it applies to any kind of a food preparation, not just for holidays. Just trying to test it on yourself. So um, that will be um, the most important message from today's webinar. Excellent. All right. And I see Lee says she's not planning to uh, cook stuffing in the turkey anymore. <laughs> um, both um, the government agency, FDA and USDA, um, they um, strongly recommend, um, you know, just uh, prepare all the stuffings as a casserole because it's much easier to um, 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 just, you know, just have a safe food handling that way. And when you just stuff a turkey, then you have to make sure that their temperature really reaches the safe internal temperature of 165, which a lot of people just, you know, forget to measure. So um, as long as you stick by that, you know, just the recommendations, I think still stuffing the turkey can be safe. However, there are more um, cares you need to give when you just cook um, your turkey. I see. Well, that's, that's uh, really good. Um, seems to me like it's a lot harder to do that. I like the casserole idea myself. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you very much, Sue. Um, I have a couple of little advertisements I want to share with everybody. Um, and these, I say, um, are advertisements, but they're just mentions of, mentions of some resources offered by um, Extension Disaster Ed Education Network. Um, this is our website. Uh, you can find a wealth of resources for teaching people how to reduce the impact of disasters, whether it's on food safety or uh, in, uh, several other um, topics you can find on the Eden website. We also are um, uh, in eExtension. We have several resources for homeowners and others. Um, including information about floods and flood recovery, avian influenza, drought, and agricultural disaster preparedness and recovery. Um, and do you have uh, social media accounts? We do. So we'd appreciate it if you'd follow us and contribute to the conversations on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and YouTube. And the last thing I want to say to you is that I hope uh, this has been a, a good webinar for you. I, I learned uh, several things again today. Um, and I'd like for you, if you have the chance, to join us for our next and final uh, webinar for 2014. That will be on December the 4th at 1 o'clock Central Time. Doctors Mike Gaffney and Alan Ladd uh, will join us to talk about what we need to do to, pre to be prepared for winter. I do hope you can join us then, and I thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of the afternoon.